Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Mandy. Sorry. Um, that was just it. That, and so people were really surprised, you know, that I like that stuff. That's when, you know, how you said how, because when you were a kid and you love that and it's like, me too, same thing. And it's, you know, there's such a, a confusion about the word Gothic because back in the eighties, Gothic romances were so very popular. Mary Stewart and Phyllis Whitney and all these people. And that, you know, I read them growing up. And, they, you know, I was deeply in that. And of course, my favorite, Rebecca, you know, by Daphne du Maurier. But because um, I like the ghost thing. But there is the Southern Gothic is a completely different thing. And it's not Southern grotesque which is more to me, Harry Cruz. Right, right. Know. Oh, he, ooh, Scar Lover. Yeah. Woo. yeah, I love him, but man, have you ever read his biography? Yes, I've got, I've got his biography and then I have, like, I've got two. Um, that scene where they're playing Pop the Whip and they snap him into the pot of boiling pork and his fingernails and toenails fall off. You just don't get more, more oh man, oh. <laughs> I know. It's like, so I, I didn't even know who Harry Cruz was. I was watching a documentary called Searching for the Wrong Eyed Jesus. Have you ever seen that? Yes. So Jim White, that's a great songwriter. And it's like, you know, and it's weaves that in like the old song, you know, the traditional whoo, folk songs that are so. And then um, storytellers and Harry Cruz, there's this old man walking down an old gravel road with two canes. And I'm like, who is this guy? And he leans into the car door because the guy, Jim White, is driving around a car and all these inter interviewing all these people. It's so cool. He, this guy tells this story about um, how, you know, growing up, they ate wild game and possums and his granny loved, like, but she would bury the head facing down. Like to get rid of the scratch, you buried him. So, he, is, but it, he, she, he said, you know, I always do him like nose down <laughs> as a little kid. He was like, why? And she said, because if you don't, They'll dig their way. When they're going to dig till they get out. They'll dig down to China and, and, and terrorize all the kids in China. If they're up, they're going to come into your bed. He'll dig out and come to your bedroom at night. <laughs> oh, like, yeah. Story. I, um, I do, you know, I write like, and I'm going to just hold up a book, uh, the Sarah Booth Delaney mystery series. I've got I'm finishing the 26th one in the series. And these are these are Southern, they're set in Mississippi, but they're more on the humorous side. And this is a particularly, I'm very fond of this book because it deals with uh, feminism and independence for women. So I really enjoyed writing this book. But if you wanna get Gothic, I do more of that in the darker books and in particular, a book that I'm bringing back this year. This is one of Kathy's favorites, Touched. And it's part of a trilogy of books set in uh, Jacksville, Mississippi. And yeah, it is- It's up to that and work in progress. Yes, it's in the work in progress, right. Yeah, I'm so excited to be bringing it back. It was first published in 1996 by, uh, by Dutton. And it's a story about a young girl who um, she is 1926 Mississippi and in a very repressive Mississippi town called Jacksville, uh, she is at a birthday party for a young girl and she decides to dance the Charleston and dancing is just forbidden in this community. And she is dancing away to beat the band and out of a clear blue sky, a bolt of lightning strikes her and it doesn't kill her but it severely hurts her. And so her mother puts her in a rocking chair in a Red Rider wagon and carries her all over town with her, her little burns and all of this. And they have a rooster named Pecos who rides on the back of the rocking chair. Now, my mother actually had a rooster named Popeye and <laughs> when she was a little girl. And grandma said that the rooster would fly in the kitchen window every time she'd been over the oven and peck her butt. So, <laughs> okay, my little, my little sister, for Easter, we always got little chickens, you know, chickens and ducks and rabbits. And, we, and they were just, we'd had, we had, we lived in a subdivision, a neighborhood, but we had like a petting zoo. 
she had a little baby chicken. She's, she's nine years younger than me. And so she got this little baby chicken that she loved and named, named her Henrietta. She loved that little baby chicken. It kept getting bigger. It, you know, it's, it was a rooster. All right. And it, it liked all of us, like us, but when my little sister, my sweet little sister, anytime she came outside, he'd flog her. So I used to have to go out first, catch him and put him up. So she could come and I'm like, and so she would cry and she's like, why does he hate me? I love him. So I said, cause you named him Henrietta. He's mad cause you gave him a girl's name. <laughs> but um, the little girl survives the lightning and she is, um, she is given a gift. She is, she's prophetic, but she's only able to predict drownings. And her mother is a, a free thinker in this town. Her mother listens to opera. Her mother reads books. Her mother doesn't buy into the BS of the town. And so they're feared and hated almost by the townspeople. And so this is their story. And it's narrated by a 16 year old girl named Maddie, who is a mail order bride to the town's very handsome, very brutal barber. So it's, it's a, to me, it's a very gothic story. And I don't know how Mandy wants to do this. Do you, do you want to read anything from any of your works or? Well, you read, you want to read from Touch? You, you want to I'll read, a, I'll read a little bit from Touch, just a little bit. And then I'm going to read a little bit from The Darkling, which is a supernatural book. I mean, it is a, it's a literary thriller, but it's more along the lines of Sarah Waters, The Little Friend. There's a, there's a, supernatural element to it but touched has no supernatural element just mean people and good people in the airless zone of southeast mississippi july is only the promise of things to come the last comfort of june's cool nights are gone and august is building building slowly in the shimmer of the sun the days grow long and hot with no relief in sight Mosquitoes and copperheads lurk in the coolest shade of the piney woods. It is only dawn and dusk that are bearable. I can still feel the touch of a July morning on my skin when the grass is soaked in silver pellets of dew and the first slanted white rays of the sun burn the green pine horizon, horizon into a dark grainy day. Even now, some 20 years later, I remember exactly. The date was July 1st, 1926. By midday, the sun was riding high in a sky bleached as pale as old lace. The air was as much water as gas. Standing in my kitchen, I could hardly draw a breath. I folded the box of taffy clothes and tied it with a red string Alika had brought me from the barber shop. From his seat at the kitchen table, he watched. He'd finished his lunch and pushed, his, pushed back the plate satisfied with the zipper peas and okra and the cornbread I'd made. In a week of marriage, he'd found no fault with my cooking. Tell Miss Annabelle I said happy birthday, he said as he pulled up his suspenders, snapped them into place on his muscled chest and reached for his coat. You look nice. I was shy with him, still trying to find where I fit in his life. He was the handsomest man I'd ever seen. It hurt to look at him and I couldn't bear it for more than a few seconds running. Ooh. So that's- Do you keep reading? <laughs> that's touched and uh, Maddie is the narrator and it's a, it's a long and torturous story. <laughs> it's great. Well, I have to tell you, Carolyn, I've been fans, a fan of yours since I found, it was a collection of short stories and Suzanne Hudson was in it. I can't remember. Oh, Delta Blues. Long. Delta Blues. I'm like, yeah. Oh, this is Carolyn Haynes. And so I pulled you up. And so I've been a fan of yours for years before I ever got to meet you. So the fact that we're sitting here and that we talk, I'm like, what the hell is going on? Like, this is the coolest thing. I'll tell you a really funny story. John Grisham gave us a story for that collection. It was um, done by Tyrus Press, a small press. And all proceeds went to the Mississippi Literacy, Literacy Fund. And in the Delta and Morgan Freeman did the foreword to the book. And when we launched it, we actually, the writers in the book made a blues band and we performed at ground zero. It was just so crazy. It was just too crazy. But um, 
So uh, here I am, the editor, and I'm going to edit John Grisham. You think? You really think? So, like, I went through his story and I suggested maybe three different word changes. And that was all fine and good. And about a week later, I opened my email and there's this email from John Grisham. And it said, Dear Carolyn Hanks, this is to inform you that I'm suing you, your publisher. And, and that's all I could read. It was like my eyes didn't work anymore. And I just went blind and I can't breathe. And I'm like, what, what went wrong? What went wrong? And then I read the next paragraph. Just kidding. <laughs> and I thought, I will spend the rest of my life getting even with that man. <laughs> well, he lives on Amelia Island. Have you gotten, have you gotten, have you uh, gotten even I, with him yet? I, I know where his house, I know where his house is here. We can, I will come and we will toilet paper his yard. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> oh my God, you guys, this is being recorded. Oh. <laughs> 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 she just said toilet paper. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> he is an attorney. I know. He was a Mississippi legislat legislator also. I used to cover the Mississippi legislature a million years ago where there was a big sign hanging in the newsroom that said, <laughs> reporters are like mushrooms. They keep us in the dark and feed us shit all the time. <laughs> Oh my, God. oh my God. You just have to have a sense of humor to be around me. He does. He does. Right? Oh, he's a great guy. Great yeah, guy. He's, he's a great guy. Well, well, like Carolyn said, he has to have a sense of humor to be around her. <laughs> hey. His, his wife sold copies of Summer of the Redeemer out of the trunk of her car. She loved the book so much. She oh, bought boxes. That's a great book. It, great. It, She's just, they're both very wonderful people. Okay. Whew. Covered. <laughs> oh, Mandy, are you going to read? Well, no, I just want to listen to Carolyn tell I ain't got shit against Carolyn. I got no, no. You got to read some of your stories because I love them so much. You just have to. It's your turn. Come on. Thanks, My little bastard daughter really knows how to write a story. <laughs> <laughs> I think the tequila's kicked in. <laughs> it may have. <laughs> no, mine not yet. Um, let's see. Let's see. Hmm. While you're looking that up, I just want to share a John Grisham story. When I opened my shop, I sent them a press release that I was opening the first hair salon bookstore in the country. And Oxford American Magazine called me up, which I used to report the Southern bestsellers to, and he was the publisher. Right. And this um, one of the staff said, you're doing what, Kathy? And I said, I'm opening a hair salon bookstore. <laughs> she goes, uh-huh. She goes, listen, let me call you back. And I thought, man, I'm never going to hear from them ever again. And it wasn't an hour later, and she goes, we're coming. And I go, huh? She goes, Oxford American Magazine is covering your grand opening. Now, my shop, the original shop, was attached to my garage and my house out in the woods, and they came. And the story that ran was uh, hairdresser to the authors in Oxford American Magazine, and Carol Dawson, who's an Algonquin author and a dear, dear friend of mine from car um she's from austin texas now but i knew her from algonquin when i was rep did the story and every southern author in the country called me when that came out and said when can i come to your shop so i love john grisham i had a tribute to him in my bathroom at my shop they um you know the book the bookstores that sold its first book of time to kill yeah he's Still goes and signs books there. Absolutely, and that's the he, way it should be. He Don't never abandoned. Who brought y'all to the party, y'all? Right. Dance with the one that brung you. That's right. Okay, I, I think I'm gonna um, read a little bit from Eva, and it's the part where the the narrator um, 
has been her. So Eva's mom and dad have, are their traveling preachers, and they have just kind of moved into this town. And everybody, everybody's really curious. Started a lot of conversations, and uh, Delene, the little girl that's the narrator, she's twelve, is obsessed with them. Um, she's scared of them, but she's also like she's so interested. Like she just wants to know what's going on. So her parents have invited them over for dinner. <clears throat> so this is Delane. I heard the knock at the door and I, I hear a knock at the door and ran to peer out the parlor window. I wanted to get a good look at them before they came inside because I knew I'd be too scared to look at them across the table. I was ready to take in every detail of the Reverend and his wife to use later to make Hank laugh. But a bright flash of orange stole my attention and I didn't see anything except the scrawny red haired girl wedged in between them. Daddy opened the door and let him in. I walked into the foyer and stood behind Mama, curious to find out who the girl was. She didn't look like either one of the adults she was standing with. You could have knocked me down with a thump of a finger when I learned the girl was her daughter. No one had ever mentioned her before, and I'd never seen her with her parents on the square. Try not to stare, but I'd never seen anyone with golden eyelashes before. She was looking down at her feet, so her thick, light-colored eyelashes seemed to glow against her skin. The skin on her face and neck was so pale that you could see the blue veins underneath, and her ears looked slightly pink, reminding me of the inside of a conch shell Daddy found one summer down in Gulf Shores. The girl's dress was made of faded brown wool. I spied a pen holding the seam together at the waist and another one at the seam on her shoulder. She was so thin that I bet she could hide behind a sunflower stalk. I put a hand up to one of my plump glowing cheeks and felt it turn from pink to red. I felt like I was showing off just standing there dressing a petticoat and a green ribbon in my hair and I wanted to run in my room and change. Mrs. Elliott was dressed as plain as her daughter. She was big, built like a man with broad shoulders and, and a wide face. Her eyebrows were thicker than daddy's and I noticed one long whisker poking out from a mole on her chin as stiff as a broom with bristle. Until, until then, I hadn't really gotten a good look at her face. She was always moving, marching up and down the corner in front of her husband and calling out to the adults who passed by. She was even scarier standing still and being quiet. She took one look at my mother in a pretty lavender dress with a lace collar and grimace, a hateful look that caused her thin lips to disappear and her double chin to make a third row. I would have giggled at the face she made if it hadn't been so disturbing. And if mama noticed, I couldn't tell, but I could feel the dislike coming off the big woman in wings. Daddy introduced the family to the Elliots and the Reverend did the same. Their daughter's name was Eva. I put out a hand to shake. Hers exactly like the grown-ups did, but she kept her hands in the folds of her rough brown wool, wool of her skirt and her eyes on the floor. I wasn't sure what to do next, but mama came to my rescue and ushered everyone to the dining room. Eva sat across the table from me, so it was hard not to stare at her as she ate. She was so quiet, you never even heard her fork touch her plate or anything. And she was so small, she barely took up any space, using only one hand the entire time, even never looked up once. So after dinner, the little girl asked her if she'd like to come out and play, but Eva doesn't answer. She looks at her mother's stern face. Don't stray far, Eva. We'll be ready to go shortly. There was a look in her mother's eyes that gave me a shiver. There was a smell, too, that I didn't like coming from her skin. It smelled like sulfur, burnt oil, and gasoline, like rotten eggs and old tractor parts. Something bad. I reached out to take Eva's hand, but it was wrapped in her skirt, so I motioned for her to follow me instead and went out the back door after Hank. I figured it was a nervous habit or something, the way she fiddled with her skirt, like how Hank used to chew on his nails until Mama threatened to put Tabasco sauce on him. I couldn't blame Eva. I'd be nervous, too, if my mama was so mean. So where are you from, Master, as soon as she stepped outside? I wanted to know everything. She raised her shoulders but didn't speak. Do you have any brothers or sisters? Still no reply. How old are you, I asked. I'm 13, Eva said in a voice not much louder than a whisper. Why are you big as a minute? I'm almost 12 and kind of small from size. I said, trying to make her laugh, but she didn't say anything else. Actually, I was only 11 and I was a whole head taller than her. When we got to the spring house, I stopped, stopped her and put my arm in front of her. You have to be careful around this part of the yard because of snakes, I said. That got, that got Eva's attention. What kind of snakes, she asked looking me straight in the eye for the first time, and I was shocked at the color of her eyes. They were the prettiest shade of green I'd ever seen. Big ones, I said. Great. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you, Carolyn. Okay. Where does this inspiration come from, girls? I mean, where is, is this your mama, Carolyn? I know your family, Mandy. I know all about your family, but where truly do you think your voice comes from? I don't know. I've just read an awful lot. And um, my grandmother and parents were both wonderful in the oral tradition. 
And uh, every night someone would tell us a story. And I mean, these were stories they made up. And, and I think too, that you get that reader's voice in your head when you read that it, the flow goes a certain way. Now I had a, a hard time learning point of view, um, narrative summary versus immediate scene, all the writer's toolkits. I started writing short stories just because I loved them so. I was greatly influenced by Flannery O'Connor, Doris Betts, The Ugliest Pilgrim, um, just wonderful, uh, Lee Smith, wonderful Southern storytellers. And I had no ambition to publish. I just wanted to write stories for the pleasure of writing them. And I was a journalist. It never occurred to me to write a book. That was like, that was what real writers did, not me. Now, 80 books later, I feel like I've become, I've, that I'm the victim of an addiction, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, it's, it's just fascinating, but growing up in Loosedale, there was no one to really tell me what to read or what not to read. And I worked as a sales clerk when I was 14 in the hospital pharmacy. And they had a round book rack. And the pharmacist told me that I could read any book on the rack as long as I didn't crack the spine or damage them and I wouldn't have to pay for them. I could just read them and put them back on the rack. And every month, the bookseller came in to change the rack. There was no bookstore in Loosedale. There were churches, but not much else. Mm -hmm. And um, so I would start, start at the top and read the sweet romances to the gothics to, you know, all the way down to the, close to the bottom was literary. And let me tell you, John Irving was an experience for me. <laughs> I love him. I and then at, do. And then at the very bottom was uh, men's adventure, you know, which were just, you know, not, there wasn't anything bad in them at all, but it was just more like killings and murders and, and you know, that kind of stuff. But nobody told me what was good literature or what was bad literature. I worked that out on my own. And for that reason, I write a thousand genres because I read everything. And so that's, you know, that's just how it worked out for me. What about you, Mandy? You know, storytelling, like I've always, um... I've always been a storyteller, which when I was saying I didn't have anything to say, I was lying. I was setting us up for our next thing. You know, I didn't, you know, it was a, I was using that because I, I love storytelling. I, I mean, I've always been one and I don't know if it's from growing up, like my, you know, childhood, like, you know, it was a little rough um, sometimes and how I made everybody work like you know I'd get people out of their things and get people back on track or telling stories and um to my parents and to my siblings and to everybody you know it's like I just always loved it and I growing up as a little kid um everybody told me stuff and I don't know if it's just the look of my I don't know what it is but it's always been that way people tell me stories um and I just love, love hearing them. I mean, as little kids, my parents, friends would tell me stuff that, you know, <laughs> little kids shouldn't, I mean, not anything bad, but adult things, yeah. but they want my advice. They just want me to hear. I was like nine years old. And I thought, I can't wait to write these down someday. I mean, I never really thought I'd be a writer because I left home at 15 and I didn't go to school to be a writer. Like I don't have a degree and write, you know, whatever. But I wanted to put them down on paper. So I don't know, just, and then I worked in medical field with the, you know, pediatric cardiology. So all the kids going through stuff in the families. Um, I don't know. There's just stories everywhere. A question. Do you have a definition of what Southern Gothic includes? I mean, I know it's like bizarre characters, eccentric characters, and sometimes dark humor, but do you have any other elements that you think are necessary? 
Well, for me, I did what I think when I think Southern Gothic, it's a, a struggle yeah. and a survivor. Like it's like there's got to be, and I I don't care what it is. Like it can be poverty. Like it can be like any like a struggle, um, a real life thing, a hard, hard you know hard something hard that somebody works through and hopefully makes it out. Uh, I, I had printed out some openings of some of my favorite short stories, but I'm not going to read them. But I do encourage you guys to read an opening of Mandy's, one of her stories, and then go read the opening of Good Country People by Flannery O'Connor. And you can clearly, clearly see that she has inherited that worldview and voice. So... Thanks, Mom. Would you, would you guys include... <laughs> Would you include dysfunction in uh, Southern? Yeah, because I'm a big Tennessee Williams. Yeah. I mean, I've read everything. And it gets pretty. I went and saw one of his plays in New Orleans that had never been aired. And I remember I was with author Michael Morris, and we both were sitting there, and we just, uh, it was way out there for Southern story. And Dys it was. Yeah, dysfunction and also I think uh, uh, oppressive, okay. oppressive parental presence and oppressive religious presence. Yeah, religious. Like, yeah. Really, and it's, I have to say, it's so funny. One of my first stories that ever was published that won at something was um, about a um, snake handling service. And after the after the award ceremony. Uh, the judges were like, we got it, you know, come up here. We want it. We've got, we've got it. We want you to settle a bet. And they were like, they all, three of them thought that I grew up in the Pentecostal church. <laughs> and one was like, she did. And her dad was a preacher. My dad was an atheist. I never went to church. Like, it's, <laughs> and so when I told them that, they were like, how did you write this story? And it's like, because I'm that whole thing. And then it's like, I'm not a, I'm not an atheist. My dad's not either. He's the deacon of his church now. It's like, he was just going through a hard time. <laughs> it was like a lot. That's was Southern a lot. Gothic right there. <laughs> but, you know, I spent a good amount of my time. Uh, I was very quiet and introverted as a child. Nobody believes me. And I have learned to come out of my shell, but I would sit under the table as my family members, the adults would play and they weren't drinkers, they were teetotalers, but they would play dominoes and they would forget I was under there. And I heard some stories, you know, some about the times that the, on 4th of July, they put dynamite underneath coffee cans and set them off. That was their fireworks. And I'm going, you know, you're just going, what? Dynamite? I mean, are they insane? But the crazy things that they did, you know, and I just, those stories, you come from a family of storytellers, both of you. Well, here's, here's a true story. My very first car was an Vega, And when people say, what color was it? And I was like, it was rust. That wasn't the color, it was rust. <laughs> <laughs> that side door was tied with a rope. I mean, I got my, I got my first car for, my, I was already married and had it. Anyway, my ex-husband, I was married at the time, he and his best friend, we, we had five acres, we've got in the middle of nowhere. <clears throat> they were cutting donuts in my Vega, in my old car, and it caught fire. And they were like, they had a case of bush beer. <laughs> and it was like, put the car out. You know, the only thing they had was that case of beer. And they were like, my car wasn't worth the cost of a case of bush, bush beer. <laughs> so then we talking about dynamite, then they used it to, um, they made pipe bombs and blew it up later. So the car. Yeah. yeah. I had a Vega. Yeah. They I, used, oh, yeah, right, I had right. a Vega and I tied the door home shut with a knee sock. <laughs> Must be something. Was it the passenger door? Yes. Must be something like with those. <laughs> In Loosedale, they had a group of teenagers who were driving down the country roads blowing up mailboxes with dynamite and one of the kids blew his arm off well okay so the guy that i was You're laughing, at, Kathy. i'm so sick you guys would pat conroy and doug marlette i used to sit with them and they would tell the stories like carolyn and i'd laugh like a 
I a banshee. And they turn to me and they go, so you come from dysfunction too. And I go, <laughs> yeah, I do. I do. And I think people that go through dysfunction and like you said, not the best circumstances growing up, we tend to have that weird, quirky sense of humor. And it, and I don't know, I think the legs in the, that's about like River Jordan telling us the story about her cousin that when her dogs died, she'd wrap them in a blanket and put them in chest of drawers in her garage. That would stink though, that would really stink. She, well, maybe she mummified, maybe they dried out first before she wrapped them and put them in the. But I do know a woman in Jefferson, Texas, who um, taxidermied her dog and she puts it on her Christmas tree each year. Oh, her little dog. Did she have a really big tree or was it a really small dog? A really small dog, but a really big tree. But it's really creepy to go in and see that dog sitting in that tree. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> nah, me neither. Um, well, it's funny when you say dysfunction, and it's like I do think of that, and it's like dysfunction. You know, when it's like that's just family. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like when people say that. So I'm like, I, and it's not just in the South. It's not just in the South. That's you know, that's another thing too. Talk about Southern Gothic, and people um, are like. So I was at a book event with Walk in my first book and people were like, these are such great Southern stories. Do you ever think you'll write about another region? And I was just like, well, I'm from middle Tennessee. I mean, I'm not writing Southern literature because it's the big thing right now. That's what I know. And it's like, I don't, I was married to a guy from New York for four years and I don't, even then, I don't think I could write about, you know, I just your, that's not southern you know it's where your heart is mandy and i truly firmly believe there are two things as a writer that i believe that each story is a gift and it's not up to the writer to say oh this is literary oh this is a romance oh this is horror oh it's the story and your job as a writer you've been given a gift and your job is to tell that story to the best of your ability no matter what kind of story it is. And the other thing is that characters come from the soul. The soul informs who they are. And that is the only two truths I know about writing. You guys, we're getting close. Um, we've got Pat Montadon at three o'clock. So um, do you wanna have any final comments? I don't have time for questions. Well, questions? if you want to run to three. It's, well, we got um, started. We did get started late. Yeah, well, that's all right. It's 2.48. We got 12 it's minutes. It's okay. No, it's okay because we have to have time to do our stuff that we're doing. I forgot. Yeah, I'm working this one too. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, we'll just, yeah, maybe we can do this some other time, Carolyn. If you're doing it with me, we can get some more people on it. We can do anything we want to do, baby girl. So <laughs> I love you. And y'all listen, this is one of the Pulpwood Queens. I would not have got to know Carolyn like this if it wasn't for the Pulpwood Queens. I don't think I don't know how we would have met. So can't and say Kathy, that enough. Kathy, when was the first time I came to Girlfriends Weekend? About the first year, maybe? I a long time ago, and then we hung out up in either Arkansas or Alabama at one of the festivals. Right. But I had my dad with me. Remember yeah, that? Yeah. Talk yeah. about Southern Gothic. <laughs> <laughs> Take your dad on, on book tour. Right, two-time Korean War vet. <laughs> and I, the first time he met Rick Bragg, I said, "This is my daddy," and he goes, "I understand. You're, you know, she wants you to come to that book festival." He goes, "I'd be glad to," and he goes. Can I have you wor your word on that and a, a handshake? And Rick Bragg shake my hand. And he said, I'll be there. I have yet to see him at my book festival. So mm. anyway, you guys, um, we'll, we'll do this again. We'll do it again. Thank you all so much for coming and hanging out with us crazy people. Oh, it's great. I enjoyed it so much. Uh, oh my gosh. Now you got to read all their books, y'all, because they're that good. So we're going to be back in just a few minutes. So get a drink and come back at three. Okay. <laughs> Do you heard her, Carolyn? Get a drink. Oh God. <laughs> I still have 300 <laughs> words to write today. <laughs> oh no.
Okay. Y'all be good. You're awesome. <laughs>